Matt Griffin uh, is a uh, professor of transplant biology here at NUI Galway. He works in the Regenerative Medicine Institute. He's a consultant nephrologist, so he looks after patients with uh, acute and chronic kidney disease. Uh, his previous training took him to the United States, where he completed a fellowship in uh, basic immunology in the University of Chicago, and then spent nine years working at the prestigious Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where he worked in transplant medicine as well as conducting um, immunology research in the laboratory setting. Um, by his own admission, Matt is a, a poor cook and uh, cannot play even the simplest of uh, musical instruments. Uh, but uh, I know that he is uh, a master of, of many trades and an outstanding uh, clinician and researcher, and it is our pleasure to hear from Matt today. So, Matt, over to you. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, Chair and Tariq. It, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. I should warn you that even with a full set of slides, I'm never entirely sure how my talks are going to go. So, bear with me. It could be a little bit of a bumpy ride. Um, but the the challenge that intrigued me to talk a little bit about and give some perspective on is the role of the patient. And uh, from a medical point of view, since the day I stepped out of uh, medical school with a degree in my hand, most of my time has been spent on uh, heavy face-to-face -face time with patients who have complicated problems that are probably going to last them the rest of their lives and that require long-term complicated multidisciplinary follow-up. So it's intriguing to me that the role of the patient and uh, the complexities associated with it should be perceived as a great challenge or a problem as I would see it. Um, so I'd like to give a little bit of perspective on that particular challenge and uh, just as a starting point, uh, here is a photograph that a colleague sent to me recently. This is a typical ward team in uh, 1988 in Cork Regional Hospital. And I remind you that that's quarter of a century ago. So it always seems more impressive to talk in terms of centuries. If I blew that up a bit, you might recognize two or three familiar faces if you're part of the medical school here. But to protect the innocent, I've only blown up my own face. <laughs> and uh, this picture, really, I enjoyed receiving it. It brought back a lot of memories, very, um, uh, transitional time in my life. Um, some of those have to do with the, the joys of having a full head of hair, um, <laughs> but more uh, germane to this particular uh, forum is that uh, it brought back a lot of memories of my first experiences talking to patients on a day-to-day -day basis, not as a student, but as a medical healthcare worker. And uh, as quite an introverted individual who had got by mostly on my book skills, it came as a surprise to me how much I enjoyed that process of communication, conversation, tasking, and uh, very often doing something that you could immediately get gratification from as having benefited another person who's in need. Now, I should also say, as I, I'm sure you're aware or anticipating, the other part of that process is learning about mistakes, bad outcomes, complications, dealing with that and trying to minimize it. But um, if someone had taken me aside at that time and uh, said, you know, it's important for you to uh, make sure that your approach to this task and this job keeps the patient at the center of your activities, I would probably have interpreted that as a truism or a platitude or something that didn't really require much thought. It was pretty obvious that that's what I should be doing. But as the years stacked up, I started to recognize that uh, subtle discomfort that comes from episodes of patient care where uh, you feel that that person hasn't been very well dealt with or somehow the goal of achieving the best possible outcome for that person has been subverted by other agendas or other processes so that the patient is no longer exactly the focus of what's going on. So a couple of quick examples related to that. Uh, an elderly man admitted to hospital with nausea and vomiting, a common complication, some signs of intestinal obstruction. 
He has an exploratory laparotomy, and what's found is widespread gastric cancer, inoperable and incurable condition. So after some consultation with the family, our team gathers around the bed after the surgery, uh, tells him that he's a little lump, there's nothing to worry about, and in a couple of days he can go home and recover. And that's the end of our patient care episode. So you might argue that that's, in a sense, a compassionate way to approach it. Um, many people may have a very severe reaction to a piece of news like that. But I could tell looking in his eyes that he knew something wasn't being said and nobody around the bed was uh, willing to step up and uh, put the truth out there and begin to explain it. And I remember that very distinctly as uh, a sour feeling about how we treated that person. Another example, several years later in a different country, um, another elderly man, the patriarch of a very wealthy family is in the late stages of a terminal illness. He's in the intensive care unit. He's on ventilator, um, blood pressure support, and now he's become septic. And it's obvious to us that care is now futile. This person is going to die very soon. But the family are adamant and not willing to let go, and other tensions um, come into play. And we spend the next week doing inappropriate testing, continuing to ramp up care uh, towards an inevitable outcome. Again, my feeling being involved in that case is that somehow the focus has slipped away from patient-centered care towards other complicated agendas that are coming into play and resulting in perhaps inappropriate activity. Now, in fact, in my experience, there are many different factors that can cause that same effect or uh, result in patient care that's not very tightly focused in a collaborative way on achieving the best outcome for the patient or uh, the person that's suffering from an illness. And uh, that's part of the perspective that uh, I'd like to convey in this uh, talk. But let's put a more positive spin on it. Um, episodes of patient care where you really feel that this has all come together into something special that has uh, worked towards a unified goal for a particular person. So I'll give you another example of a case I was involved in. Might take a little bit longer to present, um, but the, the main goal here is to contrast that with the other examples that I presented. So a woman in her 40s, she's had type 1 diabetes for over 20 years. Uh, she's already had vascular problems with uh, bypass of a peripheral artery, known coronary artery disease. Now she's slipping into kidney failure with the prospect of soon um, having to go on dialysis. And now I can tell you, if you don't know already, that such a person on dialysis has a very limited lifespan. So we sit down and talk about the prospects of transplantation. Uh, we have a whole team involved in this process. We go through the risks and benefits. The process eventually we decide uh, that she'll be listed for transplantation and a year or two later she receives a combined pancreas and kidney transplant. Her diabetes is cured and she has a chance to come off dialysis. She goes back to work spends lots of time with her family, she can take holidays, uh, it's an excellent outcome. A few years later, we run into a complication with the transplant, kidney transplant, it starts to lose function, and she's again facing the prospect of going back on dialysis. Now we have an even more complicated situation because another kidney transplant will be uh, technically more challenging we have to consider whether this is a good use of uh, a transplantable organ, and we also have to explain the risks and potential benefits to the patient and work with her family. A family friend steps forward, willing to donate a kidney as a living donor. Again, after much deliberation, uh, we decide to go ahead with the surgery, and this next transplant is successful as well, and again, 
She's able to uh, return to good quality of life, work, which was very important to her, and uh, be a productive member of society. At that time, I moved jobs, and several years later, uh, heard from a colleague that uh, the burden of vascular complications that diabetes had caused for her had eventually begun to take its toll again. Um, she was also losing kidney function and was left again in a difficult situation. So with careful um, discussion with her medical team and family and friends, including the person that had donated the second kidney to her, uh, she decided enough was enough. Um, she chose not to go back on dialysis and in the setting of very good palliative care, she died peacefully. So the, the journey I described for you, which I was part of, uh, represents about 15 years of life for that particular patient with much complexity and a lot of difficult decision making and other important people involved as well, her family and the donor and um, other aspects of her life. Uh, what I would like to uh, leave you with is um, the realization that this was a wonderful example, in my opinion, of patient-centered care. And one perspective that uh, came to me thinking again about this case is that even though I was very happy and, and proud of my role in uh, that particular story, I think it could have been replaced by another person with equal training and competence and uh, a similar attitude. And the same could have been said of her transplant surgeon and uh, of many of the other people involved in her care. So uh, the, the um, concept that I think defines what's good about this case best is that it represented a totality of input that was very much focused on making good decisions and keeping that person at the center of attention and the center of decision making. And as I think about the nature of such a process, it becomes obvious to me that this is not necessarily inherent in being part of a medical system, having a hospital or a clinic or a practice, that this is something that is a unified philosophy that everybody involved including the patient, participates in and buys into and coalesces around to create an environment where uh, these type of interactions can occur in a comfortable and uh, fertile manner, uh, to create a system where information is moved around and barriers are limited to achieving the next steps that you decide on. And perhaps more important than every, anything, uh, to have a collaborative approach that does not create a fence between the patient and the people involved in providing patient care and other important individuals involved like the family, like in this case a potential organ donor, also like the insurance company that may be paying for the care and uh, a national system uh, like an organ donor system that needs to assimilate this person uh, into their um, activities as well. And then finally, uh, we should be considering uh, a system in which continuity is provided so that one episode uh, leads into another and uh, we create a trail that for patients like this can continue on for many years and help them to make one good decision after another. And one thing I've come to realize along the way is uh, that this type of binding around a philosophy of patient-centered care is uh, very difficult to retrieve once it's been lost and uh, very difficult to impose upon a system that appears to operate by other rules. So my closing uh, couple of statements to return to this notion of the challenge associated with the role of the patient um, I would like to make the case that the more we participate in medical care that embodies this philosophy of the patient at the center, or if you like, 
everything geared towards achieving the optimal outcome for a given person and then continuing that process as their care progresses, the less of a challenge or problem the role of the patient becomes. So as this challenge as is expressed on the, the TEDMED site um, alludes to this dichotomy of the patient as a customer. In other words, do we just put our wares out and then let that person choose? Are uh, the patient uh, uh, more as a, a consumer, um, I think becomes null and void if we provide the right attitude and take this patient into a more collaborative environment. So the, the last thing I'd like to say uh, to end on an optimistic note is that I think in this day and age, um, thinking back to that quarter century ago when I was starting out as an intern, we're remarkably better positioned to create that type of patient care environment. Um, our systems for exchanging information are unimaginably better. We may not use them uh, to their full capacity. I think that the people that come to our doors are used to accessing information. They appreciate freedom of information, and they've also come to appreciate um, science and knowledge, what it can do for people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think people inherently feel a greater sense of ownership of medical and scientific details. And uh, we saw Francis Collins there, um, who was one of the leaders of the Human Genome Project. And now the person on the street is uh, aware of the fact that his or her unique genome is, if you like, a possession and something that can be valuable and unique and uh, is a tool to be used to make life better. And I think our role is to use the tools at our disposal to create an environment where we can continuously make good decisions for people in a collaborative fashion. And uh, by doing so, in my view, we have the capacity to virtually eliminate uh, this concern that the, the patient will somehow have um, a difficult role or a conflicting role in the whole process. So I have no idea how long I was talking for, but it does feel like the right time to stop. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks very much. Appreciate it.